so I guess I have one main topic, <clears throat> and then I also wrote something else on the board that we could talk about. It's kind of optional. Lucas does uh, machine learning kind of on the first specifically. Part, and it kind of hired him to help Subutai and Lewis do machine learning applications. With... Uh, so, but the first is kind of a self-contained question of. Um, well, I'll just go ahead and stand up and start presenting it. <laughs> uh, does that sound better? So, I started with the question of. Um, I wanted to understand 3D orientation better. And I think I thought a useful question for understanding 3D orientation is if you just have a simple continuous attractor network that's uh, representing 3D orientation, representing and updating it, what would it look like in the sense that, like, we know that a 2D continuous attractor, like 2, 2D location, one that's representing location is just trivial. It's just a sheet of cells with bumps moving over it. Uh, a 3D location one would probably, like a naive one, would just be a 3D sheet of cells or 3D volume of cells with the bump moving through it. Um, the equivalent version for um, 3D orientation, I didn't know what it would look like. Uh, and I felt that I would come away smarter if I did know what it looks like. And it would just in general be something that uh, maybe a tool that we would reach out and need to use somewhere in one of the places where we represent orientation, because we have a few of them. Um, so to, to kind of review um, from previous uh, presentations, and just making sure I'm not blocking anything cool, uh, reviewing from previous presentations, like we have talked about how 3D orientation can, and there are multiple ways to do this, there are multiple ways to visualize 3D orientation as a point on the surface of a sphere combined with a point in a ring. So a 2D, a, 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 a 2D value plus a 1D value. Uh, for example, if you think of this dot as being, if you think of a rat running over the surface of the sphere, uh, then this dot is just where is the rat and this dot is which way is it pointed. Um, you could also, we haven't talked about this much, at least not in this form, but you could also think of this point on the sphere as being the direction of gravity and the rat's reference frame and an agent's reference frame. And this being, we haven't really put this language on it, but strictly speaking, this would be relative to that gravity vector. Like if the gravity is that way, what direction is north relative to the gravity vector? Uh, and the ring is strictly uh, speaking, it would be representing that. Um, we, we basically talked about that, but not in that language. Uh, but basically, the idea that orientation can be represented as a point on a sphere, direction of gravity, and a point in a ring, say, head direction cells, uh, is something we talked about. So this is one way to visualize it, and it's, it's a valid way. Um, but it doesn't tell you much about what a continuous attractor would look like. It doesn't tell you much about what like that volume of cells would be. So uh, second way to think of orientation space is uh, you can you can imagine it as being the volume of a sphere where the sphere's radius is 180 degrees or pi um, and the way this the, the way this comes about and this really has a um, I talked last week or the week before about um, how angular velocity can be thought of as like a rotation direction uh, and an and a, and a, and amount. Um, so the idea of taking a vector, pointing it in the direction of the axis of rotation, and having its length be the rotation amount. Um, you can imagine all of orientation space being a sphere around a point where that point is some reference location. Oh, sorry, whoa, 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 reference orientation. <laughs> I, I read it and that didn't I'll just say Ori. Uh, the, where, where the center of the sphere, let's, let's say you have like a default orientation or like the rat on top of the sphere facing north is its default orientation. That's here at the center. Um, all of the other orientations of the rat of the agent can, can be reached by rotating about some axis by some amount up to 180 degrees. So uh, just to read this off, the, or the center of this is like a kind of a default orientation. The direction of the vector is the, the, the rotation axis of the agent. Uh, the length of it is how much it's rotated. 
And the interesting, the interesting thing about this sphere is that all opposite points on the surface of it are the same. Um, the, they're uh, rotating 180 degrees on this axis is equivalent to rotating 180 degrees on the opposite axis. It's like rotating 180 degrees one direction versus the other. I mean, they represent the same orientation. Yeah. Um, which is to say, well, uh, I'll just go ahead and say it now. Which is to say, if you were to distribute cells throughout this volume, um, the cells are near each other. I mean, in the way that they're near each other within the volume, but also the cells that are over here are next to the cells over here. Um, is that possible to distribute it that way? Yeah, uh, it's it's hard to visualize, but yeah, you can um, you you could set up connections between cells. Oh, connections, stuff. but not physical. Right. Uh, right. You can't you can't place them. Well, I was trying to imagine like a bump in a continuous attraction network. It's not just connections. The bump physically. Yeah. Has uh, to move cont contiguous. And cells. I'll, I'll show animations of that happening. Well, do you think that's possible to do this with contiguous cells like this, or is it? It's just more of a, a mathematical problem. I think it's possible to do it with uh, actual cells. I mean, I can yeah, show yeah, you. Yeah, cells that are contiguous in space, not just connected. Oh. Okay, let me understand the question. You're saying, can you lay out cells? You were talking earlier about, about some, like, you know, how could cells be arranged in a 3D volume or yeah. something like that. And the question is, um, you know, I can imagine you can do like uh, grid cells. You can you can figure physically how this con continuous cells and the bumps moving between them, and and it keeps repeating itself, and it all works. You know, the cells that are the, the bump moves continuously in physical space. Yeah. And the question is not obvious to me. You could have the bump move that you could move it physically move it in contiguous space here. It, okay, uh, you can't you uh, you can't arrange cells in physical space so that um, they have so that the bump never hops. Yeah. Uh, okay. So so you can arrange cells like this, but the bump will sometimes hop. Now it's interesting because if you think about grid cells, you could argue the bump is hopping too. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Yeah, but but. So, so I, yeah, I want to push on this point a little bit, yeah, because the grid cells like, okay, so you have this two-dimensional sheet of cells, and the bump moves off to the right, and it has to reappear on the left, but the way that it looks like the way that's being done is the bump, you've got multiple tiles of these, and the bump continues to move and move and move, and a new bump appears. And so I'm just wondering, I've wondered this question about, uh, with orientation, whether it's possible to have a similar type of setup or not, where, um, you could argue the bump moves back, but if I just have a continuous sheet, could the bump continue on if I have multiple copies of the same thing? So could that same property that would work with grid cells work here, I guess, is the question. It's not obvious to me it could. It, it, my intuition would say not, but but I don't really know. Do you have a sense of that? Yeah, I don't know. No. Uh, I don't want to waste time on I think it. it'll be, uh, uh, for now, I don't have a good answer. To okay, I mean, because the question, you, you did pose the questions, what would a, um, I, in, in terms of cells, you started yeah. off by pr proposing in terms of cells, and you can imagine what they look like. So I was, uh, at this point, we could abandon that and just say, no, we're not going to worry about that. Anymore. Well, I'm still going to be showing the cells. Uh, okay, you'll see in a second. Um, I, I'm going to show bumps moving through cells, bumps hopping, and... Well, okay, again, one thing is to say, I can make the connections work this way. Yeah, the yeah. Other is this, it's a difference between having grid cells representing one, you know, one little module versus the series of these modules to get together so the bumps continue to move. I, it's not worth going. It sounds to me like you haven't really been focusing on that. So um, yeah, I'll, I, yeah I'll, I'll show you the rest I'll of it. But the, I, I, won't, I won't have answers to every one of those. Oh, questions. I should ask this. Yeah. 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 Uh, <laughs> I wonder about that a lot. <laughs> so um, now this visualization is correct. Uh, cells can be distributed in this way. Um, one thing about it is that Let's see. If you were to um, uniformly distribute a bunch of cells through the space of possible orientations, um, yeah. So if you were to just like say, "All right, so you cell, you represent this point with this. You cell, you represent another one. Have them distance each other from distance so themselves from each other." all the possibilities. Or, or yeah, uh, fully enumerate except yes, fully enumerate except. Um, I mean, there's not a population them. code. It's an individ each individual cell represents a unique. Uh, yeah. Or yeah, yeah. Um, and you have those cells distance themselves from each other maximally, and they're tuning. Um, 
they will not be uniformly spread through this sphere. Uh, this the sphere does not correctly um, does not correctly dis like isn't that's not equivalent to randomly placing them in this sphere. They're going to be kind of more centered to the center or something like that. Um, so just we we shouldn't go too deep into this, but I just had to state for like just for the record, the actual way to visualize 3D orientation space in a way that keeps all metric metric relations to them clear. Um, it is the area of the top half of a 4D hypersphere, uh, which can, which, I mean, here I'm just showing a series of spheres as the fourth dimension changes. And all of this is just to say, you can take this set of shells, the set of spheres, and pack them into a 3D sphere. Um, th there's a second way you can reach this conclusion that orientation space can be um, visualized as the volume of the sphere uh, like this. Um, this way gets the metric more correct. Technically, the cells are going to be distributed evenly on this, the area of the sphere. Yeah. Uh, anyway, again, uh, when you say I'm always confused because when you say the cells are distributed, I'm imagining physical uh, neurons, but you're not talking about that. I don't know. That's never what I mean. I know. <laughs> and I, I, and I, <laughs> you mean the receptive field in yes. yeah, orientation yeah, spaces yeah, yeah. Yeah, distributed. But but I think again, I think this. I keep. I'm a one track person on this thing. I think the physical uh, instantiation of this is going to be essential. And so when you start talking about like, oh, it's a 40 heart, 40 heart issue, okay, yeah, fine, that's good. But I'm trying to imagine what would that be equivalent now? How could I implement that in um, in actual neurons and, and what would they look like? I'm going back to like the whole idea of mini columns and the slabs and things like that. So I don't think it's, a, it's not an irrelevant question. It's an important question. Uh, and, I, and I just want to, and every time you see this with cell, that's what I'm imagining, but you're talking about something else. You're yeah. talking about the, the distribution in this uh, sort of conceptual space, not in a physical space. Uh, yeah, in, in my in my mind, my mental model is that these cells are probably kind of scrambled, and I'm taking them and sorting them in different orders for visualization. Uh, I don't think they're scrambled, but, but they, 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 we don't want the physical bent. I'm, I'm not placing a bet on whether they're scrambled or not. Okay, right. you're just not thinking about it yet. You're trying to just focus on this part. Sure. Uh, so I guess before I just show the pictures, um, the, so. The, kind of answer to this what does the can look like well the answer is if you take if you if you choose one cell of the continuous attractor that represents 3d orientation and just like center it like, like you, if you're sorting cells in a particular way just choose one cell center it um, the rest of orientation space appears as a sphere around that uh, but there's not inherently a right a correct center uh, so it's kind of strange and I'll, I'll show visualizations of it I'll just go ahead and do that. Before you do that, I, yeah. I, it'd be interesting at one point, because something you said at the very beginning, well, I just want to keep these ideas on the table, is that um, you said, oh, it's easy to imagine, uh, you know, a location, um, like a 2D location uh, in a continuous attractor model. But actually, it's not. I mean, it's like because it, it, because it's because the continuous attractor model repeats um, you don't really get location. You have to, and, and the, the way we've got location and, and other people do too, is you have to have different modules at different, you know, um, phases. Um, and so it's funny that the actual physical cells that we know, the grid cells, are not good at representing location because they- it's not uniquely. What's that? Not, not uniquely. Yeah, but that's the whole point, right? They don't really represent the space. We have to come up with a trick on top of them to get them to represent a 2D uh, space. And the same would be a 3D space. So um, it's it's just an interesting thing that the actual neurons, the way we think to see them, are not good at doing this. They, they they do rotate around more like an orientation does, um, and less like what we want them for location, which is you don't want them to rotate. We don't want them to be a closed space. We don't want that um, uh, that you know torus effect. But that's what we get. I'm just pointing out that the, that they actually don't do what we want. We had to come up. People come up with tricks to get them to do what we want, and then. But the property they do have is closer to the property of orientation, which is they do wrap around. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I find that an interesting clue, and um, we shouldn't forget. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I'll go ahead and switch to. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm sharing my screen, right, Matt? So I'll go ahead and put the. Uh, let's see. I have a few things I'm going to show, and um, yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll I'll vary this little animation a few different ways as I go. Um, so here I'm showing that I'm using some some stuff from the previous demos where I'm showing an agent moving around on this sphere. Uh, here I'm just re rearranging the camera. 
But um, oh, it's nice to speed in on both on the fractal fifty. That's cool. <laughs> oh, it, I guess I just never um, bothered to do it in, in one of these demos. Yeah. So. Uh, <laughs> So, but now what I have here on the bottom, I'll, I'll add more little pictures in a second, but this is that um, population of cells distributed uniformly through uh, orientation space. Um, I, took, I took a bunch of cells, assigned them orientations. This is the uniform distribution, which you normally argue it wouldn't be. And that's because I've kind of normalized it to, to correct for that. Uh, technically, if I, if I showed this as, oh, it's normalized density. Um, if I sh showed it as, um, the sphere behind me with yeah. the with the volume, um, the, it's kind of more dense on the center than it is on the outside. It's not as nice. Uh, it's not totally obvious. Like yeah, it's not. But it, it but I did it's measure. It's not a striking effect. I thought it'd right. be like really bunched up. Right. Now, but but I, I did measure the densities of it and confirmed that uh, when I do it this way, the density throughout the sphere is is constant. I could show the math if you really want, but I'm not going to right now. Are the cells only on the surface? Or do you have no, they're, 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 they're inside. Like if I, as I'm, yeah, it's hard to, yeah, 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 you're right. I think when you rotate it, you can see it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, just kind of the perspective effects. Yeah. Uh, so it's not obvious if you in the middle. Oh, this is not. This, this is, is not, not anymore. Yeah. Uh, so, um, so, now, so each cell represents some direction plus and that, uh, how much you're going to rotate. That yes. Now, three yeah, so I'll go ahead and give those some more context now. Um, I'll show kind of these little axes or like, um, so here at the center of the sphere is like this default orientation, this default, like the, the starting orientation kind of standing at the North Pole with the red facing to the right um, and moving a certain direction in the sphere. Um, I'm, I'm showing these axes as like other as rotations of the agent. Um, moving along this axis, this top up axis is like rotating on the blue, on, rotating on that axis, mm -hmm. or so it's rotating on the blue plane. Sim similar with this axis is like rotating on the pink plane. Mm -hmm. This is like rotating on the blue plane. Um, and that, that's what it would be like on a physical sphere. Uh, that's like you'd be rotating in the in the actual space. Yeah, yeah. It's a little yeah. So like. So like a cell that's centered right here represents the this orientation. Yeah. A cell that's right here represents this orientation. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and okay, I'll temporarily hide those little pictures. I'll bring them back soon. But uh, now I'm going to show. Oops, could have put check boxes here, but instead I have to type true and false. Uh, I'll go ahead and show a bump of activity moving through it. Um, so here's a bump. I'll show it moving as the agent moves. Is that those, those, what are those yellow squares for? Those, those are the active cells. Oh, oh so, so multiple so cells. Active. Is that, yeah, I got it. Yeah. Uh, and so I'll go ahead and start a bunch of movements. Um, I must have pressed, oh, there we go. Um, so now the agent is moving just randomly over oh, through orientation space. And this bump of activity is moving, tr tracking its orientation. Um, and it's, uh, I'll show pictures a little bit that makes this clearer, but right now you'll see that um, the bump is, is usually arcing from position to position. It's not going in a straight line from position to position. That's because your movements are random, right? If you, um, well, if no, you it's... Just, if you rotated just on around an axis, then it would go one direction. Each of these movements is a rotation around an axis. Well, why would, if I just rotate around one of the planes of the, of the sphere, why wouldn't it just move towards the center or away from the center? So it does if... Um, I can show yeah, you that occurring. Ago, right? Yeah. I mean, so it, I mean, I know if the thing randomly moves on the surface, it would do that. But if I was on the surface, I just rotate it on one axis. Right. Would they move in a linear direction towards the center? It right does there? if the bump is at the center. Oh. If if the bump is at the center, then all rotations are going to be some straight direction. Yeah, but when they when I when could I reverse it? So if I have the center and I rotate, I go straight out. But if I yeah. rotate, it wouldn't I go straight back? Yes. If your direction of rotation lines the bump up with the center, then yes, it's going to be a straight yeah, yeah, line. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but if it's a different direction, which it usually is in any visualization. Yeah, um, but you could design, I mean, under some, yeah. It, it's it's sure. always straight under some yeah. visual, un, under some view. Yeah. Uh, yes, and, and I'll show that. <laughs> so it's not a property that it's always hard. It's just normally with mm -hmm. unless you set it up otherwise, it would look like it's art. But right. you can set it up so it does not art. Right. Uh, so now I'm going to um, start 
changing the visualization, changing which one's at the center. Uh, so I'm going to remove the bump temporarily, and um, I'll go ahead and and let it start changing. Um, so what you see here right now is, um, well, if you were a four-dimensional being, this would appear as a 4D sphere rotating, and it would be very intuitive. But to us, it's kind of messy kind of it, it, here uh, what's the messy part are the um, individual cells moving relative to each other there's there some, some cells moving toward the center some are moving up and down yeah uh, so they're not moving as a mass you're saying they're right they seem to have individual right movements. um now here this one's kind of fun um now i'm bringing the, those axes uh i feel like when star wars or something i was like yeah, it's a spaceship <laughs> So uh, these are the same, like sort of the X, Y, and Z axes, or whatever you wanted to call those before. But I'm showing wh uh, where they are in this rotation space as I'm as I'm choosing different cells to center it on. And the fun thing is, like these paths, these lines from um, this orientation to this orientation are becoming curved, which is to say, under this view, if you move from this orientation to this orientation, it's going to arc. It's going to make this kind of arc shape. Uh, but under when it's when it's centered, it's going to be more straight again. Um, meanwhile, since I'm, you can see now that um, what I'm doing right now is I'm rotating the view along this axis. So this line's staying straight. Uh, here I'm just really trying to get a little bit of an intuition for what this attractor looks like or how everything's connected. Uh, and now I'll go ahead and show one more picture. Um, I'm going to make that stop reorning because it's making my CPU sad. Uh, I'll go ahead and um, I'm going to go back. I'm going to do one more thing now. Um, I've been showing this agent moving around this sphere and this bump moving with the agent. Now I'm going to add one more thing that occurs. After every movement, I'm going to recenter the bump. I'm going to move the bump. I'm going to um, basically I'm going to change the view so that the bumps at the center. So I'll go ahead and do this. And what's the intuition why you're doing this? Uh, to get another sense for, um, I don't know what what this what this all looks like. As a, as a, <laughs> <laughs> so so yeah, it's it's like uh, it's like. I, mean, I, I, I can try to imagine. I, totally I, sure. <laughs> I think I know what's going on, but it's not sure what intuitions I'm going to get from it. Okay. Yeah, uh, here what I'm showing for one thing is now the bump's movement is always a straight line. Uh, it, so I'm, as you can see, it's kind of like the bump is reaching out and pulling a part of it to the center, reaching out, pulling a part to the center. And every time the reach out is a straight line. Uh, but, because, yes, but this wouldn't happen in reality, right? Because when the animal moves, these orientation bumps don't be changed, right? No, the, that the, those second updates are just for our... It's, it's, it's just the visualization okay, tool. It's just to show that the, once you get back to the center, things are straight from there or something yeah, like that. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. The, the, the whole point of this was, um, was okay, the, there are multiple points. The point of that last demo was just get some, get a little more of a sense of the, um, the connectivity of these cells, what the kind of topology is of it, of it all. Uh, and yeah, that was just the, okay. the last part. But I think it's worth pointing out some like this would not happen. Oh yeah, yeah. Right. Just making it totally clear, we're not saying that there's that the, the, any, going on. The, the the bump isn't pulling cells into a different shape. Yeah. Or anything. Yeah. Um, so I guess the I guess the, the kind of the conclusion. Well, one one thing, um, one reason I wanted to think about this was, um, and. And other, uh, when we've been looking at um, these other ways of representing, these ways of representing orientation that involve the surface of a sphere and a ring, uh, there's always a little bit of weirdness that there's always going to be some point on the surface of a sphere that is messy. You could call it a singularity. You could call it uh, anyway. The point is that if you if you if you draw arrows over the surface of a sphere, there's going to be some point where the arrow is suddenly hot. Uh, and, and it makes it feel like um, orientation is inherently like this hard thing where uh, it, where orientation is inherently something that's messy like that. Um, but what I wanted to is prove to any messier than that? I mean, just the idea that orientation has this point where it flops over. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that's 
that's that's surprising maybe up front, but he's not terribly messy, right? It's not like it's, it doesn't mess up everything completely. So you could just say, well, that's what it has to do, right? But what I wanted to point out here is that if you represent orientation and its fullness, like if you have cells represent, if you don't break it into multiple pieces like this, that problem no longer exists. Uh, those, those, that weirdness oh, is an artifact I see, I see. of, uh, of this, of this like, particular representation. Or, or um, any, any type of representation that breaks, uh, I, I, I think you can say anything that breaks 3D orientation into multiple populations, like breaks it into multiple variables, is going to have weirdness like this. Um, but that, but that weirdness is an artifact of the fact that you're breaking it up like that. And that was one thing I wanted to understand: is is, the, is this is this fundamental to orientation that you have these? The South Pole is always broken, yeah. or or and is you're it? You're saying no, if I view it in this other way, it's not right. Yeah. Um, and under this view, like maybe maybe this changes by animal, maybe who knows? Uh, maybe it changes by part of the brain, but. If you do find this the, a ring, if you do find head direction cells, for example, in an animal, it's it's still possible that the animal actually has one of these three D attractors, and the head direction cells are really just reading it out. Yeah. Uh, and because the under because um, this three D version just works, it requires a lot of cells. I don't have exact numbers on this. Here I had like fifteen hundred cells being visualized, uh, but. Um, and, and it's the kind of thing where the more cells you add, the smooth, the more accurate the path integration will be. Or the, uh, anyway, um, uh, there's this possibility that uh, that updating of orientation occurs in this 3D space, and then um, these other things like the direction of gravity and head direction are kind of read out from that. Uh, and uh, it might change by animal. It could be, but it's, it's also quite possible that it's not, right? right. It's, it's so not very, yeah. In fact, you know, it seems to be more likely than the opposite, but it could yeah. be. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, the nice thing here is that this is much fewer cells, and they're always being used. Um, the, the one point that the paper that we were basically talking about from Kate Jeffrey's lab, um, one thing it brings up is that the weird thing about having a full 3D attractor for orientation is that many of those orientations are going to be very rarely visited. Yeah. Uh, and so it's just strange to just have the exhausting neural material and, yeah. and, and keeping that all correctly connected and everything. So um, yeah, uh, the, the thing I wanted to, the thing I'm glad that I know now is that these, um, these, the weirdness is an artifact of this style of representation. Might, it's totally possible it's there, but it's not fundamental to orientation. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, that's pretty much that topic. Um, I went ahead and uh, I figured it would be useful to talk a little bit about where all this fits into our models, uh -huh. and, and it would probably provoke some discussion. Hey, Marcus. Yeah. Um, would you share your screen again? Oh, wait, are you still? Yeah, well, never mind. I am, but I'm not going to actually use it again. I got it. I got it. Everything's cool. It was all my okay. fault. Cool. Yeah, I'm using the whiteboard here. I'll turn it toward this item. Cool. Using that. Um, so um, here I wanted to talk about where orientation is represented in our, and uh, I mean, our model can mean a lot of things, but one version of our model that we've drawn before, uh, the version that we presented at Cosine last year um, and the good cell meeting is um, I'm going to use part of this is me showing my point of view or using the terminology from a while ago to uh, to talk about in, in the past, uh, for example, in a meeting a couple weeks ago, um, I was saying that um, that the location of the sensed feature is represented in a, in a different way than we usually have talked about. Uh, and, and, I, and I kind of provocatively was saying that, I mean, I guess the, this is probably the writing from back then, um, the location of, here, here's one thing. When you're viewing a coffee cup, as, you're, as, you're, as, you're, as your eyes moving over the coffee cup, um, are you representing the 
the location? Are you representing like if if you if you have like a laser shooting out from your eye and hitting the cup? Are you representing that location, or are you representing where your eye is at, relative to the cup? Um, and I just wanted to lay out one coherent view of all of this that does represent the location of the sensed feature, but in a different way, is kind of what we talked about in the cosine poster last year. Um, so to keep the, um, this might confuse the conversation or it might make it less confusing, but I'm gonna use this terminology of, um, instead of saying child object and parent object, I'm gonna say feature and object. Yeah. Um, but they're equivalent. Yeah, sure. okay. yeah, yeah. Uh, and so we have these three layers down in the bottom of the cortex uh, that, that we often talk about as representing locations and orientations or some mix of the two. Uh, and just laying out this model, um, the 6A and 4 are doing our normal thing that we talk about. It's, it's a location of a sensor, for example, a touch sensor relative to some basic feature like a cylinder or, uh, or a cube or, uh, or a handle, <laughs> which might be a little bit of stretch, but let's go with it. Uh, so yeah, this is just the basic um, model from our paper locations in the neocortex. Uh, but we're also, adding orientation to it. Because, yeah, yes, exactly. Because that, right? that, was, that was one of the things we talked about. Is, is, is that sufficient to, to predict what you're looking for? And I think what you're saying, in this particular example, you're going to say, yes, it is sufficient, right? Uh, say, yeah. Location plus orientation, that's the only thing yes. you, the only context layer for it. Yeah. Um, now, one thing I'll throw in, um, I didn't know how to denote orientation, so I just drew like a the volume of a sphere somehow. The volume of a sphere that's like supposed to be like this. Um, but this this circle might actually be broken into multiple subpopulations. It might the orientation could be represented in different ways. Okay, Location could be just, represented. Yeah, yeah. You're just saying we have the the trapezoids for uh, for location and yeah. storing. So the but yeah, what I've drawn it's in here is yeah, yeah. There's just an example of how it could occur. But you could swap in any of these for something else and have it still work. Uh, so, um, but conceptually on a high level. That these labels will apply to all of those, um, to all of those, no matter how you swap in those details. So um, we, in this model, the child object and the parent object, or the feature and the object, both have their own location space, their own reference frames. Mm -hmm. And six, we've talked about 6A representing the location and the feature's reference frame, also known as a child object's mm -hmm. reference frame, um, the location of the center. Uh, 6B as location of that sensor. By the way, the motivation behind this was um, as I was moving from thinking about touch to thinking about vision, I was running into a set of problems. So usually when I talk about sensors in this picture, I'm usually, I'm primarily thinking about like, like a camera or, or your eye. So, so let's, let's explain. You say sensor, location of the 6A, location yeah. or location sensor relative feature. Are you saying that's the camera at a distance? Yeah. That, okay. So, but the moment ago you said you're going to try to make it compatible with the idea that the feature is actually on the object. Right. Yeah. Right. But right now you're saying no, I'm not representing that. I'm going to represent right. the eye position. So you right, and this is where we have a little bit of a different point of view. Uh, this is always going to be the eye position. Uh, I'm going to use okay. So location of the eye in one reference frame location of the eye and the kind of the parent reference frame, the object. So if, so features here are like cylinders or these, uh, we'll call that a rectangle or uh, shape. Uh, and handles, objects are like coffee cups or briefcases, uh, taking the handle and turned it to the side. Mm -hmm. um, and so location in the space of the, the feature, location in the space of the object, um, in my view, well, one coherent way to set this up is now you have another population of cells detect the transform between those two. That transform you use in the same word as displacement type of thing? Yeah, uh, yeah. The, the you're including orientation now. Uh, you're not introducing a new concept of the word transform. No. Just going back to the, the term, the same one we use for uh, displacement. Yeah, uh, yeah. It will, basically, yeah. We've talked about if, if, if you were leaving out orientation completely, this would certainly be a dis Displacement in the strict sense of the word, uh, we'd have to. Anyway, we could talk more about that. What you don't have scaling in here, right? 
No, there's no scale. There's no scaling in here. However, um, there's no scaling in here. However, if you just like uh, you just change the implementation details inside the boxes, suddenly there would be scaling, and these labels would still apply. Uh, so the, the the thing I wanted to point out, yeah, is that when I first laid this out, I described this as a transform. Um, and later I realized another other language for describing this is uh, if, you, if, if you're representing the transform between these, the displacement between these, another way of saying that is you're representing the location and orientation of the feature relative to the object. Yeah. Which is another way of saying the location of the sensed feature. Uh, that's all the same. Uh, is there anything different than anything we've done in the past? Well, sure. just to say that, like, um, I would say that um, I'm confused how this, this we, we've we've debated whether the location of the sensed feature needs to be represented anywhere. Uh, I've argued that it didn't because that because it was in a previous it, yeah, because we were yeah. talking this language of child object and parent objects. Yeah. But if you change the object, if you change the language where this is features, this is object, um, then then I am representing the location of the sensed feature in this. I'm, I'm missing that distinction. I'm, you lost me there. So this to me is it, you're, this is what you've been arguing all along that the sensor you're, you know the location of the sensor um, the camera from the distance of the object. So even though I'm a, it, it, there's a large much larger space of potential things I, my sensor location would be in, <laughs> and so this is the language you've used before, but I don't see what's new about it. Uh, no, the, okay, everything I've said here is review. Uh, well, you did say you start off by saying I'm going to resolve that problem of the sensor at a distance, uh, and that you can make it look like it was not sensor at a distance. Um, but I'm missing that. Yeah. One. So one question I have. Maybe it's the same thing. So. So you have this position of the sensor relative to the feature. Yeah. Um, and so you know if I'm looking at a feature and it's getting closer, or further away from me, that position keeps changing. Yeah. Same thing, sensor relative to the object, as the object is moving closer and further away, it keeps changing. Yep. Um, but the feature itself, relative to the object, the position, that never that doesn't change. Correct. But when you use that moving look, location of the, the sensor relative to feature as context for L4, doesn't L4 have to learn a, a whole bunch more stuff than it would if it was the position of the feature relative to the object or the position of but the position of the feature relative to the object could cause many different sensory inputs. Yes, that's right. So how are we gonna, how we, what's the resolution? Of yeah, that? so what is the... The resolution is that what is predictive of the sensory input is the location and orientation of the sensor. Yeah, but, but, but then that we just leads to this learning problem. So, okay. That, so I thought you were going to resolve... You, you thought I was going to talk about the learning problem. That's what I kind of talked about. We, both of us have this trick of using the thalamus to scale or using some trick to scale the input, which then reduces the learning problem. That is not what I was trying to solve here. Um, what, I was, what I was pointing out here was that um, both of us are representing the location of the sense feature. Just in, uh, just, what's it relative to? It's relative to the... Yeah, relative it's, it's to not the just a scaling problem because if I move this way, you know, the, the location keeps changing as well. I don't know. It, uh, it, it, so the, this, this is fundamental. Is, like the mini calls are right here. Solve the, this is one of the things I that don't know if they go through a lot of or not. resources to solve. It. Or maybe it has some sort I, of. I don't think mini comms are. Pre, uh, some sort of genetically determined features that kind of. This is still about how, how these are associated with mini columns. But uh, I, I think that that's, that is going to be one of the. Well, it's, one it's of the a things huge burden on L4, as soon as I point out, yeah. if we expect to learn all things. So, I mean, there's this monstrous clue that's hanging over this whole thing here. Let's go with the idea that layer 6a projects to the thalamus, and let's say it's doing the scaling thing, right? That thing is doing. All right, so I don't understand how to interpret that in this picture yet, but right now we say, okay, the thing that's, that's being used to predict the input to layer 4 is also being used to scale the input to layer 4. Um, and, um, and, and yet, layer 6b does not seem to be doing that. There's no, there's no, as far as we know, there's no, doesn't, doesn't have a role like that. So somehow we have this sort of one thing which is leading to a scaled input and the other one which is not. Um, I'm just think, I mean, we just have to recognize that there's a, that's going to be clearly part of the solution to this problem. Um, 
And, and I know you've said, you've suggested that could be part of it, like if you get to this feature as a sort of a, uh, you know, some prototypical distance or something like that. Yeah. Uh, but I just, that doesn't sound good to me. It doesn't feel right to me. I, um, I mean, maybe it's right, but it just doesn't feel right to me. So, uh, so is there, I, I, I'm really confused today about whether you're proposing something new that we haven't thought about no. before. Uh, no, the, the thing, I, okay, it's been most of a year since we really talked about this setup because, uh, and um, yeah, because a year ago was the yeah, good time. I think the new thing is now more clarity of how these orientation spaces might be represented. I have been working on this for the last well, year. So. Uh, uh, but I haven't tried to drive this point home that this transform can be described this way. Uh, that, that this transform this can also be described as the location of the feature relative to the object. Um, in a long time, and I realized that, I should, I should that make this point. That is the definition of the displacement. Right? Yeah, yeah. So that, that that is not a new idea. That's an idea that we proposed years ago, and um, and so I, I don't think any of us have been arguing against that. Okay, so I would certainly th this is only this is purely review. I guess okay. I'll get into uh, this I thinking I that. I didn't know from what we said you had a resolution. It, no, it's purely review, and I just wanted to stress this point that that this is the uh, both of us think that the brain represents the location of the sense feature. Uh, but I think of it as not this path integrated um, location, but more like it's more the displacement between two path integrated locations. Yeah, I, I, think, that's a, I, well, I think that's we all agree with that, right? Oh, okay. Isn't that the displacement self concept? Sure, but I, I guess the, um, okay. I, I'm dismissing if there's something new that I, I want to know if there's something new that you think about. There's, so there's not something new. I, a couple of weeks ago, we talked about some stuff we disagreed, and I realized I should have better, better articulated that this was the model in my head. Uh, and okay. maybe I'm now realizing you actually understood this was the model in my head. Uh, yeah, so, I think I understood your model. I just, I just yeah. feels like it's got a problem. Yeah. And I, I don't know how a solution to this, but, but it feels like this, this doesn't really resolve it in a way that seems practical. Um, I feel this is another trick to involve. There's something else going on here we're missing. Um, not complicated, but it's um, you know, we, we have this basic problem that the look you know we have um, the location of the sensor is is variable, in, especially in vision, and and uh, so we have to deal with that, and that means that if I just recognize something at you know some feature point, I, it's going to be relative to my eye, or my eyes could be relative to it. Uh, I mean, that's not a very good way of learning the object. Right. I, yeah, I wonder. You know, it's, again, one of the things that strikes me is, again, I don't have a solution to this, but I just want to keep putting the pieces on the table. The idea that that the six A is changing the scale is not just changing the scale of the input; it's changing the scale of my motor behaviors. Right. That's it's it's like saying so. But it, it, the cells are thinking I'm moving X amount angle into position. Let's say move my eyes. Some, some Brain. But in reality, my eyes move. My eyes move less and more. Thanks for the phone. And um, um, so, the question that. So it's 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 a there's a total sort of subterfuge of some sort that's going on here, where the, you're acting in one way, but actually everything is scaled. Both the movements are scaled, and the features are scaled, and um, and so the, the cortex doesn't know the difference. This is coincident with your idea, maybe the prototypical distance. Um, um, but um, I just don't know what that would be. It doesn't make sense to me. And I just want to throw that out again. Again, I don't have a solution to this problem. Um, OK, so we're just reiterating re the, the, uh, um, the problem. Why do you prefer feature and object versus child and parent? Is there a reason for that? Or is it just, just like today's applicability? Uh, my main motivation here was I wanted to be able to use the words location of the sense feature. And because it's easier to say than location of the sense child object. And, and if and it um, if my goal is to try to uh, connect to your exist to our to our existing language, uh, I wanted to say like no, I agree with you. The location of the sense feature is represented. But it's represented in this way. Uh, okay, I guess I'm missing whereas that. sometimes we describe L six A as being the location of the sense feature. Uh, welcome, new viewers. By the way, you're watching the Minta research meeting. This is live in Minta HQ. Object 
objects all the way down, right? It's reference angle, reference angle, reference angle, reference angle objects of objects of objects. And so we started off when we first started thinking about it, we had this idea, oh, there's a feature on an object, and we realized later, no, that's not really the right way to think about it. We really should be thinking about the reference angle to the reference angle and object to the wrong object. So we've used the language of feature and object, but we've all agreed that that's really not the right language. Um, the, and yeah, the, this one. That one is, is more correct. And now I'm just trying to understand why you're going back to the other one. Yeah, just, there's also uh, kind of the current sensory input that's coming in right now, this edge at this particular orientation. Which doesn't match either of those things, right. that's and like, that's what typically people think of as a feature. Yeah, and so there's a, we have to be careful about that. You're right. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Because I'm dealing with the, like the yeah. rock. The, the rock. That's the, the yeah. 90, 100% of the world outside of the Menda. Yeah. When they say feature, they mean like the orientation coming in. Yeah. You know, at this point in time, and and I see why you're doing this. One of these just pointing out yeah. there's a terminology issue when we communicate outside. I mean, I'm writing about this in the book uh, a bit about this idea of. Um, um, you know, and I'm using a map analogy, so it's, it's maps of maps. Um, and it's like, I um, think I have a location on a map, that's a map, and I think it's a location, it's another map. It's like, okay, there's a building, and that's what, there's a map of that building. And um, there's never any feature, right? It's, I'm trying to, trying to come up with language that fits this um, well. And so I, I you know, totally adopted this as like, yeah, it's uh, maps of maps, it's objects of objects, it's, you know, and so. Um, uh, so I'm going away from feature objects, kind of thing. I don't want to describe it that way. You know, I use the terms a bit in the book. Uh, it's just interesting to talk about what language we use for this stuff. Um, yeah, and when we write it up, we just have to be very precise. What yeah, mean by yeah, it. yeah. Okay, so uh, there's no new. Um, you're just being articulating the problems yeah. we had before. And well, I, I think what's new is that now we might have, even though it's not a full neural circuit, we have some sense of what those circles might actually be. Well, I do. I mean, we know they have to exist, and we know here's a mathematical sort of model of it. Um, we don't. We know what it has to do. And this is a deeper understanding of what it has to do, but I don't think I have any deeper understanding how the neurons do this. Um, so yeah, I guess my second motivation for drawing all this was to show this in context, right? Uh, and thinking, yeah. saying that, like, okay, we have two. We kind of have two fundamental uh, use cases. Two fundamental questions for orientation and location. Um, one of them is what's going on inside of one of these boxes? Uh, how, are, how are location and orientation represented? Yeah. Um, and the second is how to multiple of these, uh, how do you detect the transform between them and determine one from the other, etc. Yeah. And um, anyway, I'm just putting that out there, put, showing all this in context. The set of problems in front of us are like, uh, what is actually going on inside this rectangle, and what are these? How do these layers actually talk to each other, or how would populations of these actually? Operate? Again, I, I don't know this as a fact, but I just I want to keep reemphasizing. It, it appears that if you if you think about the classic orientation that people think about in V one, that 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 somehow you know goes through these layers, right? And so these guys are t they're somehow linked together, where that's not true of these things. Um, so that's just something to keep in mind if that's true. Uh, the other thing, I just, you know, when you're talking about, I assume you're sort of at the end of this. I'm done, yeah. The other thing, when you're talking about the 4D representation, um, it struck me, it reminded me of something. I don't know if it even has anything to do with this or not, but it reminded me that we think about, oh, there's these orientation columns, right, in V1. And, um, and people, you know, all talk about it. And then we say, oh yeah, but that's not really true. There's really these slabs, right? So this, we've talked about this quite a bit. Um, uh, there's these slabs of orientation. And, um, and so, uh, and, and so that's like an extra dimension. So like, this is a, this is a, you know, one dimension, and this is other dimensions on that same thing. It, remind, it just reminded me of like a hyperdimension. And no one ever explains, you know, there's never really a, a good explanation why these guys are like this. I think I've seen a paper on that it's, it's stuff like um, knowing the orientation is not enough because these are direction selective, so there's different speeds yeah, and there's different yeah. phase, but, uh, spatial frequency phases. Uh, but are they arranged size. along there in that dimension? I think they differ. I don't know how nicely they're laid out. Or I have the impression that even within a mini colony, you saw different, um, different uh, directional sensitivities. Yeah, yeah. Um, but there are other dimensions to represent, yeah. and so we have at least yeah. one other direction to go there. 
That's you know, even that's an interesting question. I mean, you know, the whole idea that's a huge part of the literature is the directional sensitivity of these cells. Most of them are directionally sensitive. Yeah. Um, and we talk about orientation as if it's if it's not motion. You know, that there's some static thing, and then you update. Yeah, it sort of implies the direction. It, it sort of implies that yeah. these cells themselves are encoding direction. It's 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 like there's you can't just say what the what the orientation is. You have to know the orientation is represented by which way you're moving. Yeah, they, um, they encode orientation, direction of movement, and also the speed. I think. Yeah. Uh, there's so it's almost. I mean, it's kind of a two D version of, of this. Yeah. So you know, maybe the whole way of thinking about the stuff is wrong in some sense. Like there's a there's this other these other dimensions that have to do with movement that we're not thinking about at all in the analysis. Um, I mean, the an easy thing that comes to mind in the context of continuous attractors is, in one way, to set up a continuous attractor the way most people use. Um, Cells are direction selective. Uh, I'll go ahead and draw. Yeah, I remember this. Yeah, yeah. The, um, essentially, like if this is if this is a two D attractor sheet, um, and I and I'll just like I'll zoom in on one part of it. Yeah. Uh, it the cells are actually like there will be one for this location that is actually like north tuned, one that's south tuned. And this is all in models. This is all in models of grid cells uh, or et cetera. Yeah. Um, but so there's one that uh, that fires primarily when the animal's moving quote unquote north, one that fires when it's moving east, et cetera. And that's what causes the bump to move in that direction. So, yeah, so a series so, of attractors. But then, but then I wouldn't want to represent my orientation by looking at those individual cells because um, you know, in the end when I'm learning the object or you know, learning the, the displacement of the object to another object, I don't really care about what movement I was getting. Right. That this is an internal mechanism to make the thing work. Right. But I don't really want that. So it's almost like it's almost like a second a second ago here where it's like a super tiger. I can have all these different orientations, and these could be different uh, movement directions. Um, but in the end, it's the it's, it's if I had like the mini column equivalent representation for it, the mini column says, Oh, that's the orientation I want to use for learning. But these individual cells are going to need to update in the, the system, something like that. Um, um, yeah, because this is sort of this is what you need for movement, but it's not it's not what you want for object representation. Right. Um, that's a big clue. And remember all these clues we have to remember. Uh, it's a little weird, also, if you think about our, just our classic temporal memory. When you think about predictions, yeah. if, if you can have a cell that has a bunch of cells that have the same orientation, but depending on the direction of movement, they would you just naturally have different cells. Wait, 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 wait. How is that in our temporal memory? Oh, that is temporal. Our temporal memory would naturally separate these cells out. Uh, Does that make sense? Or, uh, uh, if you think of, if you think of a, an edge moving in a certain direction and velocity yeah. as a sequence, yeah. then the individual points of the sequence. Yeah, but that's, it, that's only true for temporal memory, right? What is it true for object representation? No, no, I know, I know. I'm yeah. just thinking, you just. Even our pure yeah. temporal memory would separate these things out. Yeah, okay, yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, it's good to get more insights as you're doing work as, um, on the nature of these things. So, what's the next step here? The, the neural circuit, or what is the. And part of the, motiv part of the motivation for drawing this was to provoke that discussion. Uh, and. I would like, you know, I, I keep kicking myself because I would really like to work more on this problem and have more discussion on this. I just keep getting stuck in my writing because I still don't feel like I need to do that. So, like right now, I would be able to figure out uh, how to how to connect up these layers so that they perform a full coordinate transform, um, such that with what we've documented so far, we could do this copy cup example, but we can't do the briefcase example because the handle being handle is rotating. Um, and I could, I'd be if if it were the right thing to do right now. I could I could implement this so that it does both the coffee cup and the briefcase. That said, I already know what it. I don't know the fact that I know I can get it to work. I don't know what information I'll get out of getting it to work. Uh, mm -hmm. So anyway, I'm putting this all out there that 
we have two space, two orientation questions to answer what's going on inside here, what's going on between these. Often when I'm presenting at these, I'm not mentally equipped to figure out what I'm doing next because I yeah. just put all my focus on yeah. this. So this is the state of things, and then I'll go think. Another another way to uh, another just general approach to the solving the problem. I mean, here you're starting off with the representations of orientations and how they get updated, and the representations of location, how they get updated. You know, and then another way to, to do it would be to perhaps this is a very fuzzy idea, but just focus on what is the absolute representation that would represent the object as we expect it to be. Um, and then ask later, how would I get to that? Um, I don't even know how to do this yet. I'm just saying, I might say, okay, assuming I had, you know, an object that's represented by a bunch of child objects in, in, the, in the reference frame of the object, which we all assume in the end, um, and start from that position and work my way backwards. Um, I feel yeah, like I was trying to understand that too. Like, where is, is there a stable representation of the object here? That's what we would want. Well, layer three, I assume layer two, three. We'll see here. It says feature ID, which is not oh, the object okay. ID. I mean, uh, the, I, the way I would naturally do it is um, layer five. The, yeah, the union yeah. of all layer five. Um, uh, well, for one thing, each each layer five, each feature relative to object, is specific to the object. So you could classify the object based on this. Yeah. You could have another population of cells. Maybe there is a layer two and a layer three. One of them's feature, one of them's object. Uh, there, there are ways to do it, but I, I don't have. Yeah, it's not. The question is, what is the voting layer? You know, is it both L five and L three? Yeah. Or, yeah. Um, we have two voting layers. That's what we know. Yeah. I mean, another question that is kind of specific to this diagram, but another question is, um, yes, I this puts a large demand on layer four, layer six, on this connection to learn a lot of stuff. Uh, if I take, uh, one way I think about this whole model is I've just um, taken kind of a classic view of computer vision and encoded it into neural uh, into neurons, like this idea of having this set of like this set of basic primitive things that you learn every view of, and then you rearrange them into different shapes. It's kind of like if you were solving vision from first principles, you'd probably that you would you'd you yeah. land on that at some point in your reasoning at least. Well, it, it's um, classic, but it's also bleeding edge in the sense that capsules are also kind of in the same. Point. Sure, sure. <laughs> um, so, but because it's because it's kind of like this intuitive thing, people have reached that conclusion before. Uh, and for like I could list people um, to talk about like both Marr and Biederman. Um, one thing they had in their in their primitives, like their their cylinders or whatever, is they assumed the system could like could kind of um, skew them or sh reshape them in different ways. Like you see a new yeah. a, a new cylinder that's bent in a slightly different way. How do you represent that? Uh, so, like another area of focus is in our diagram. It's like what is going on in this layer six, layer four. Could you give it some more flexibility of some kind, where it can like misshape a? I don't know. It can it can take one of these and do a, a skinnier cylinder or something like that. Yeah. Neural mechanisms for geons. Neural mechanisms for these parameterized features. I I don't even know where to go with that. But that's another that that that's another way to really make this work in the real world. Well, um, you could start relying a lot on the whole scaling features of the thalamus yeah. if you wanted to. Um, I always felt that the way we somehow when we do that, when we see a novel thing, and I've talked about this quite a bit, we see a novel thing, uh, we, we always have to, our, we are always attending the subparts of always. It's always what we're doing. It's a part, 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 part. In fact, most of our conscious perception is the subparts. It's a feat, it's your, the child objects. You know, I, I, I must move my eyes over this board. I'm, I'm aware that I'm looking at these different parts. If I'm not, if I'm looking, if I'm trying to read what's on the board, I'm looking at the different parts. If I'm just looking at a picture and not even trying, you know, once I know it, I don't have to do that. But in the beginning, I always have to look at parts. And as I'm doing it, every time I move my eyes to a new part, I'm going to figure out the displacement between some part and another part. 
And so as I'm building up the structure, I'm going to build a bunch of displacements. And somehow there's going to be a similarity between a set of displacements and this thing and another thing of different coffee cups, different size. I, always, I guess I'm saying that the answer to that question of, you know, the geons, which I never liked, um, I still don't, so just put it on the table there, um, that the, the answer to that is, is, is it's really tied to the whole attentional mechanism. And you're attending the parts. And as you attend to the parts, you are recomposing the object every time. Uh, especially if it's, if, it's, if it's the exact same thing you've seen before, you don't need to do that. The, the columns are over done. But if it's different, I have to I have to attend to the parts, and only by attending to the parts do I end up seeing the similarities to other things. And I've argued that sometimes you, I get to attend to several parts. And say, oh, this part of this object is like a motorcycle, and these parts over here are like a flower. Um, and it depends on which order in which you attend to them, um, because some substructure will be similar to something else. I guess I'm saying that part of that answer, I think, is going to involve attention on the fact that we view by uh, sequential attention uh, of features. Um, and I, know, I, I think that's going to be part of the answer to that question. Yeah. I mean, Merkel with the apple. He's not here. <laughs> no. So I'm trying to figure out, do we know what the best thing to do next? Do you have a sense of that part? <laughs> I need to start having my presentations ready a day early so that I can then focus on that question. No, but that's also it's yeah, something that we as a group we can decide. Sure. Yeah, it's good if you have opinions uh, <laughs> on it. Uh, that helps. Well, I know what I would do next, but I can't necessarily say that's what. Marcus can or wants to do next, or he can do next. I mean, I, I, well, I, know, I know you like the 3D location thing. Uh, uh, that's what you're thinking about. Well, I think I, I always like to think about these neural mechanisms. That's yeah. what I like to think. I like to use those as a set of constraints uh, on the solutions to the problem. Um, and so I start on the right here, and you start on the left. Uh, uh, this is also all in service of an end paper. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We haven't yeah. done over that. We, we, a while back, as you suggested, we started writing down some of the issues that Mark has been kind to leave them up there on the board. Um, um, yeah. I mean, talk, yeah, talking about that for an eventual paper kind of provoked all this discussion. Yeah. As we talked about how orientation would, would really work. I mean, the nice thing there is scale. <laughs> <laughs> if we've done one, two, and three, uh, not really done everything, but if we want to take a, if we want to skim the surface before diving deep. Well, that isn't that the whole question we're talking about here. Yeah, as opposed to figuring out the, so one option is we could figure out the neural circuit for orientation. Yeah. The other thing is we could dive deep into scale. See, I don't think we even know the neural circuit for location. I'm beginning to doubt the entire interpretation we have. Um, and I've said this multiple times too. Is okay, we know these grid cells exist, and the whole solution we come up with is you got multiple grid cell modules, and you're going to be sampling from across the grid cell modules. And this, this, as a you know, the tank paper and so on, there's growing evidence of that thing that may not be right, and there's got to be something else going on. And I made the point that orientation as a single ring attract isn't sufficient either, and it has to be something else going on. So now we know there's something else like this, this uh, surface of the sphere or the gravity vector or whatever we want to call it. Um, and I also think so. I don't think we even understand the location anymore properly. I think it's something. I think it, 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 I don't know if I. I would say I'm a, a certain of this. I'm just saying it's certainly an intriguing idea that the, the insufficiencies of location and the insufficiencies of orientation. Well, if the insufficiencies of orientation seem to be solved with the gravity vector or a, a object dimensional director vector of some sort. Um, that, that 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 may be part of the solution for the location as well. Yeah, and this is consistent with the idea that if, if really these mini columns and these orientations that are going through them, whatever they represent, um, maybe it's maybe it's representing the, the, the gravity vector in some sense, um, then that's being applied to both the grid cell modules and to the orientation and um, and that's and so I, I, I don't know if we, I don't think we even understand this one anymore. <laughs> I think the model we propose, which is consistent with other people, is uh, is a bit suspect in my mind at this point in time. Um, 
So, so one one thing that I snuck. Oh, well, going backwards, I know. I know. <laughs> <laughs> but, but yeah, as I say, always sometimes it gets it always gets worse before the answer appears. So go ahead. So the, uh, one one thing that I um, put into the paper columns plus locations in the neocortex uh, was I, I thought this was interesting and just worth including. So I made sure to include it. Was that the model when it has only one module? Still, for, work, uh, for uh, the uh, location, for yeah, one one module for location. Uh -huh. So, like the layer four, layer six, yeah. we have just one of these. Ignore this circle, ignore yeah. this. Um, it still successfully narrows down to a single bump. Um, it still the, the the mechanism still works. However, it doesn't represent location uniquely. Yeah, so how would yeah. it work if it doesn't represent your location? Well, location? the fact that it narrows is still interesting. Oh, oh, oh. It narrows, so, but not enough. It's, it's now representing a lo lo uh, an ambiguous location on an object, but it's narrowed. Okay, but it's still not sufficient to be specific. So what if every cortical column is representing something ambiguous, but it's still narrowing down to that? It's, it's removing ambiguity, but it's, it's removing some ambiguity, but not all. The, I mean, the observation is that if you if you yeah, if, yeah. If, if one module if you have only one module you can still do something useful you're you're still narrowing something down. in some sense you have multiple modules across cortical columns you know, yeah like, you're you know, basically instead, you of, instead features, of looking but, at multiple visual modules you're basically going to rely on multiple yeah. columns um, which in case would any individual column actually know so I feel like the no, would be a an individual more. column can never learn the, can never be certain where it is. Correct. So if I just touch something with the right tip of my finger and I move it over an object, it seems like I can I can narrow down what that object is. Um, I don't get. Uh, it, it could be certain if that configuration of features is unique with respect to this module operation. Brains. Uh, Thanks for the like follow. If you see, uh, you know, if you see a particular feature above another feature, yeah, and you never ever see, you know, that feature one above feature two anywhere right. else, then you know it's this object. But I still, even though you have, I still cannot represent my my location uniquely. No, but you wouldn't need to because nothing similar is there. Well, okay, but now, now I want that, to, now I want to predict my next input. So I move my finger, and I now I now have another ambiguous location. Uh, based on that ambiguous location, I cannot predict the input. I might be able to do it if I knew the object in the ambiguous location. Maybe, maybe not. Uh, but it still doesn't seem right. And we don't we don't really see any of those feedbacks from layer two, three to layer four. We do seem back to layer five. Um, so anyway, there's some problems with that still. It seems like there might be some problems with that. So an ambiguous location will predict uh, multiple sensory inputs. Yeah. And, um, but it won't predict every sensory input. No, but, but, I, but it feels like... Well, it depends how much stuff you depends, yeah. yeah. I mean, it does feel like, though, even I can consciously imagine the feeling I'm going to get when I move my finger to this new location. And so that I can I can generate a non I've talked about this too. You generate a non-silent prediction. There's a there's an ability to say, oh yeah, this is the feature I'm really expecting to, to just we never resolve this issue too, that there's silent predictions less in the temple memory, which I'm sure they're going on. Uh, but there's also uh, conscious, you know, consciously aware predictions, which is sort of like I think in that case what you're predicting is the, the entire next child object. Um, Just to answer one question, you, you said that the capacity would might fall a lot when you had only one module. It falls, but not by a lot. Um, capacity does not is capacity scales sublinearly with number of modules mm -hmm. because it's not the representation representational capacity scales exponentially, but the union is only scales a little bit. Thanks for the follow, Dudian. As you add modules, and then we have the whole weird thing with the tank paper, the the different the the. the I forget what the term to use, but the, the different bumps had different, you know, there was encoding in the bumps themselves. So if you have one Witzel module and there was nine bumps. What do you mean in the height of the bumps? You need a Thalamus poster. That was a very 
poignant feature that they pointed out. Um, yeah, and that's, I can point to one other paper that found that. Oh, is that well. right? Yeah. Would you, would you, oh, yeah. I, I am always talking about Kate Jeffrey papers for some reason. Okay. Anyway, okay. The, the, the funny thing is, this is yet another paper from the Jeffrey lab uh, that um, rats moving in 2D around a box, uh, some of its firing fields are much stronger than others. Firing fields of play cells? Firing fields of grid cells. Grid cells. So a, a single cell will fire much more reliably. Um, at one part of a room than another part of the room in one of its fields. So that's interesting. So, and, and that's reliable. It's repeatable. Yeah. All right. So that can, it goes again, that, that supports, uh, can, would you please send me that paper? Or, yeah. I appreciate that. Um, that goes again with the idea that, okay, one grid cell module, which has um, the four phase clusters or six phase clusters, whatever it is, um, that there's an, there's an additional coding scheme on top to the, actually the 3D or the, 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 the non-repeating representation, in some sense, could be encoded that way. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder if the same thing would be viewed as seen with uh, orientation cells. Um, in, in any phase, like for example, here's an orientation cell that always represents this orientation in the box. But in different locations in the box, it could have different scales or at different, you know, 3D, you know, sphere things, <laughs> whatever you want to call that. Um, you know, it, I'll get the paper. It, where Marcus under said. this model, this is the same cell I could, regardless of this three dimensional thing, but, but which cell becomes the strength of it could vary depending on. Um, so imagine now I have, I have six phase clusters as this tank showed. Maybe I have six ring attractors. And, um, and, and yet they, they're all behaving correctly, but some of them are more active than others at any point in time, um, which would be a similar type of coding scheme, you know what I'm saying? Um, all right, I would like to read that, that paper about that. I think that's a huge clue. That's why, that's why I got excited about the tank. Remember, I saw this presentation, and it was one, it was one of the things that jumped out at me. Um, it's like, oh my god, a whole different encoding scheme. I hadn't even thought about it. Um, that's a big clue. Maybe I'll take that paper in, uh, and review it. How about that? That'll okay. be the next thing to do, a good thing to do. Yeah, I'll send it. All right, and maybe I can do that on Wednesday. Cool. Okay, that's at least yeah, one, we'll one thing to do. <laughs> For <that. laughs> All right, thank you. That's good. Those are great animations. I don't know what we can do with them, but they're great. Yeah, there was a, there's a four, 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 Folklore about a video game or an or animation where you're viewing a four dimensional hypercube projected onto 3D, projected onto 2D. Okay. Uh, so basically on the screen. Yeah, on the screen. Uh, on the screen. Um, and you're able to navigate around this four dimensional hypercube. And all you see is the 2D projection uh, you know, in 3D, the wireframe. And apparently, as you move around it, it's completely confusing. Okay. Yeah, because it's you're moving around in 4D, and we're not. It's similar to what you're yeah. trying to show here. But if you keep doing that for a while, apparently, it just clicks. Oh yeah. And you get it, and then suddenly you you have a completely predictable map of this 4D hypercube. Wow. Um, it just reminded me of what yeah. you're trying to show here. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I can it's not a video game. It's like a demonstration or something. It's because there's nothing. There's no game there. It's just you're navigating a 4D hyperview. But I always thought that would be like fun to do. <laughs> but I don't know how long it takes before. In the beginning, it's completely unpredictable. Right? So I don't know how long it takes before it yeah. snaps. But um, anyway, I just mm -hmm. just reminded me of that. Thanks, you guys. Yeah. Thank you. Um, would somebody take the double back? I'm going to log off. Yeah, sure. Thanks.